What happens when we die and after we die has been a major concern throughout human history. To make sense of death and dying, many cultures have given death a recognizable form. For example, the black-robed, scythe-wielding Grim Reaper appeared during the Middle Ages in response to repeated instances of the bubonic plague that decimated cities across Europe. Today's youth-obsessed society, we look for ways to stay and look healthy, hoping to delay or reverse aging. We measure our cholesterol, track our steps, color our graying hair, and even pretend to enjoy eating kale and flaxseed in an attempt to push back our visit with the Grim Reaper. The length of your telomeres, those DNA repeats found at the end of your chromosomes, have also become a recent marker purported to foretell biological aging. Several companies offer a laboratory test to measure telomere length and claim to be able to convert the measurement to biological age. Is this an accurate indicator of overall health? Do shorter telomeres suggest the Grim Reaper is standing on your doorstep? We'll investigate these questions, plus take a closer look at what happens to the genes inside our cells when death does occur. That was a particularly fun one to film. <laughs> but that was a really hot costume. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to retitle this a little bit. So instead of, can biotech predict my death, I'm going to actually shift it just a little to, can it predict my biological age? And I want to make a distinction between my biological age and my chronological age. So my chronological age is how long I've been on the earth. So 47 years and 10 months is my chronological age. My biological age is how fast my cells are aging. Are they aging at, at a rate that's consistent with my chronological age? Are they aging faster than my chronological age? Is my body older than you would expect based on how long I've been on the earth? Are my cells aging slower than my chronological age? Are there parts of my body that are aging faster, parts that are aging at the same rate, and parts that are aging at a slower rate? So that's kind of the key question. How fast am I aging? And as you think about that, you know individuals that seem to be perpetually young. They seem to be, have slowed aging. You also know individuals that seem to be old before their time. So if we could identify a measure of biological aging, it could be incredibly important. Let's lay out a small number of facts, just a sampling. So in 2015, there were 901 million individuals 60 years and older on the earth. By 2030, there will be 1.4 billion. This is actually called the 2030 challenge, that in 2030, there will be a huge additional number of individuals over the age of 60. And in our societies, as we age, the number of health issues that we face increases. So our health becomes more frail, and the expenses associated with aging increase. Here's just one example. The global cost for dementia, 2015, 891 billion. By 2030, 2.1 trillion. And that's just one of the issues, one of the disorders that is associated with aging. So countries, as they experience larger and larger percentages of aging individuals, have to think about allocation of resources and a larger amount of their budget, their country's budget, your own individual budget has to go to being prepared for or dealing with aging related issues. So there are a number of groups that are looking at ways to delay or slow aging. Now, let me be real clear, this is not so we live forever. This is not necessarily delaying life or expand, extending lifespan. 
This is slowing aging so that a smaller part of our life is spent dealing with aging issues. And if you can figure out that, how to slow the aging process without adding 50 years to our lifespan, then potentially you begin to shift some of these issues. Now that sounds incredibly cold and simply in terms of economic issues. And I apologize um, if that sounds flat on your ear. Um, but that is a lot of what drives research into anti-aging. That and the fact that as a society, we are generally youth obsessed. We do everything we can to try to prevent us from looking old. This is a slightly different aspect of that. This is not changing our appearance. This is actually slowing aging. But in order to do that, in order to be able to identify, hey, I think I've developed an intervention that actually slows aging, think for a minute about what that process requires. We would need to get hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of individuals who are aging, give them this intervention, assuming that we've gone through all the appropriate clinical trials, let me be real clear about that, give them this intervention and then look to see if it slows aging. But how long do we have to watch to see if it slows aging? This is not an 18-month study. This is one or two decades. That's just not feasible. So there's a big search to find biologically relevant markers of aging or a biomarker for aging, something that tracks with aging that continues in a specific way so that I can measure it today, I can measure it six months from now and a year from now, and if it truly is tracking with aging, I can actually, within an 18 month time span, determine if I've slowed aging without having to watch a patient for 10 or 20 years. So that's the concept, that's the driving factor behind looking for these biomarkers of biological age. So there are a number of candidates out there for what's a good biomarker for biological age. We'll talk about two of them um, in this session. If I can find a biomarker for biological age, if I can find something that serves as a proxy for age, then I can begin to develop, I can try out interventions. Those might be small molecules, drugs that may slow aging. They might be gene editing tools like we've talked about in previous sessions. They might be other therapies, but I can actually test that out in a dish full of cells, in a laboratory animal, and I can use this biological marker of aging as an indicator of whether it's actually making a difference. And then if I find out that it's making a difference, then I can move to clinical trials and I can go from there. So there is huge amounts of work going into looking for a biological marker of aging. Now, you know, it needs to approximate our chronological age. But again, as I said from the very beginning, we don't all biologically age at the same rate. And oftentimes our biological age and our chronological age don't match. So we're going to talk about two candidates for biological markers, biomarkers of aging. The first are telomeres. So at the ends of all of your chromosomes, you have a section of DNA that is essentially repeats over and over and over of the same stretch of DNA. So the 2009 Nobel Prize was awarded for scientists based on their discovery and study of telomeres. And so this is an image from the Nobel Prize from the 2009 um, awards. So they're at the very ends, at the tips of your chromosomes. And in this instance, so the sequence specifically varies from organisms. This is uh, Tetrahymena, a small water-loving organism. Uh, and it's one, two, three, four, five, six, four C's and two A's. And you can see it's repeated, repeated, repeated. It's repeated hundreds of thousands of times. We have a similar repeat at the end of our chromosome. If you are wearing tennis shoes and you look down and you see that little bit of plastic at the end, it's called an aglet, that piece of plastic that protects your um, tennis shoes. Those of you that are young enough to know um, the Disney Channel Phineas and Ferb, there's an entire song about aglets. Um, <laughs> so um, yeah, anyway, um, they protect the ends of your tennis shoes from unraveling. Your telomeres protect the ends of your chromosomes in the same kind of way. And here's why. 
we don't have time to get into this, but due to the way that your cells copy their DNA, they are unable to copy the very, very ending piece of one of the two strands of DNA every time your cells replicate. So we lose a little bit off the end of your chromosomes every single time your cells divide and copy their DNA. So the telomeres provide you a buffer that you can shorten, that you can eat into, that you can lose without running into chopping into your genes. So they protect the integrity of your genes by giving you this buffer that you can shorten. And so on the image here behind me, you can see that when we're born, we have somewhere around 8,000 letters worth of ATCG, uh, not ATCG, of this repeat at the end of our telomeres. And as we get older and our cells divide and our telomeres get shorter, we have less and less space at the end. And ultimately what happens is we lose enough of our telomere or we lose so much of our telomere that we now are in danger of, of shortening into our genes. And at that point, our cell sends a signal that says, we're too short, we've, we're, we've been around too long, There's, it, we're, we're past a critical phase, and this cell often initiates programmed cell death. So it is one of the markers of how long a cell divides. Now what's really interesting is that there's an enzyme that keeps this long, that keeps the telomeres long, it adds repeats back in the cells for men, your sperm cells, to keep, as those sperm cells divide as you get older, to keep them from getting short. So that a sperm cell and ladies in your egg cells that were created before you were born, you got full length telomeres. So that when we have a, when we have a conception and a new child, they've got full length telomeres. So your egg and sperm cells are protected from this shortening. This enzyme is silenced in your body cells, which is why you continue to shorten, except in many cancers. Many of your cancers have found a way to reactivate that enzyme so my telomeres stay long, so cancer cells divide really, really rapidly. You would think they divide so rapidly that they would chop into their genes and initiate death. That enzyme keeps them long so they can continue to divide. Yeah. So the concept that your telomeres shorten over time, a lot of people have said, well, maybe the length of my telomeres is a candidate for a biomarker of aging. There have been over 6,000 studies that have been published looking at the length of telomeres and saying, is telomere length a good candidate marker for, bio, for um, biological aging? Women, on average, have longer telomeres than men. That seems to be true of multiple different aging studies. Men seem to age faster based on these markers than women. Men seem to have a shorter lifespan than women. So there's something happening where aging is different on average between the genders. Shorter telomeres have been associated with increased mortality risk, coronary heart disease, Alzheimer, and other measures of age-related traits. So what they've done is they've looked at populations that have, for example, coronary heart disease, and they've measured their telomere length, and they've found that in many of these studies, with many of these diseases, there are shorter telomeres. So that's one symbol that, yeah, that, is, that might be a really good marker of age-related disease. So maybe telomere length is a good marker for, um, for a biological marker for aging. A study was published a small study of men that had prostate cancer. And they looked at their telomeres, and then these men were randomly assigned to try different things. Um, changes in their diet, changes in the amount of exercise they got, uh, changes in how they responded to stress, uh, and how they were, um, their attempts at mindfulness, for example. And they found that in individuals, in men that engaged in these kinds of activities, that when they came back several months later, the telomeres were actually longer. The telomeres got longer. Now, let's be real clear. We're measuring telomeres in your blood sample. So I am measuring the telomeres in your white blood cells. That doesn't necessarily mean that the length of the telomeres in your white blood cells correlates with the length of telomeres in other parts of your body. So I am doing a measure, 
and making a lot of assumptions about what's going on in the other telomeres in the rest of your body. But this finding that you could in the short term alter the length of your telomeres has now led to a whole group of companies that offer to test the length of telomeres <laughs> for a small fee and then you can, you can have them test your telomeres as many times as you'd like and you can see if you've actually lengthened your telomeres. And so they've come up with a way, they say, a proprietary way to convert the length of your telomere in your white blood cells to your telo age, your biological age. And so they can tell you your telomeres are the biological equivalent of an 18 year old or an 83 year old and hope that that then inspires you to make specific lifestyle changes. It's kind of like your own lifestyle coach. How long are your telomeres? Let's get out and drop and give me 40. You know, it's that kind of, that kind of thing. And again, there have been thousands of studies on telomere length. So telomere length does seem to be a marker of aging. But the challenges of that are that it isn't the best predictor of aging. So it is a marker of aging, but there are other markers that are actually much better at predicting mortality. So I'm gonna show you this, there's a lot on this screen. This is a study that looked at about 1,000 individuals from Costa Rica, 1,000 from Taiwan, and about 2,600 individuals from the United States. They enrolled all these individuals into studies, and they asked them a whole set of questions at the onset of the study. Things like, are you able to walk a mile? Are you able to climb a flight of stairs? Um, how many days in the last year have you been hospitalized? Are you married? What's your education status? What's your weight, height, and BMI? What's your diastolic and systolic blood pressure? They measured um, certain enzymes in these people's body that are indicative of kidney function, indicative of, um, of uh, heart, uh, heart health, uh, and then they administered a whole set of cognitive tests, and they took blood samples and looked at the length of their telomeres. And then they followed these individuals for five years and they looked to see how many of these individuals passed on. And then they went back and said, were any of these markers good predictors of the likelihood of an individual to pass away? Of a, so are they good predictors of mortality? And then they drew them, they uh, plotted them on this chart. So each one of these is a different one of those populations, Costa Rican, Taiwanese, and United States. And anything that's in this general range is a pretty good discriminator of mortality. Anything in this range is moderate, and anything down here is not really very good. It's not much better than flipping a coin. So what you can see in all three of these studies is that the best predictor of mortality is age. Well, yeah. <laughs> Duh. But that tells you that is still the best bio-age marker we've got. And we, we've already talked about the problems with that. You don't want to wait 20 years to see if an intervention worked. Oh, gee, I should have had a V8. I mean, that's not the way you want to do this. So the next best are how mobile are you? Can you walk up a flight of stairs? Can you get up and down from a seated position? Can you lay on the floor and get back up on the, you know, get back up? I don't know, that might not have been one of the questions, but that kind of question, set of questions, how mobile are you? And then the cognitive tests that they administered. Those two were both pretty good predictors of the likelihood of mortality. And then we've got things like um, daily, uh, limitations of daily life. Can you do the following sorts of things or are you limited in your ability to do those things? Um, creatin creatinine kinase, which is an enzyme measure. You can see over here marital status, uh, BMI. Um, and then right here in red, this red triangle, that is leukocyte telomere length. So even though leukocyte telomere, even though telomere length is a measure of aging, and individuals that have age-related diseases have shorter telomeres, it is not a very good predictor of mortality and of aging. So, do we have any other biomarkers that we could work with? Francis, you had a question and I, I blew right past it. A clam that lives hundreds of years. 
Ah, the clam has no shortening telomeres. So the clam keeps that enzyme active in all of its cells. And so one of the things that causes cells to die, the clam has figured out a way to avert, to work around. Yeah, that's interesting. Same kind of thing. There are people that will sell you telomere, telomerase, that's the enzyme, telomerase pills. Okay, let's talk about this. For an enzyme like telomerase to work, it has to get into all of your cells in active form. When you take a pill, it has to get into your stomach where the acids break down proteins. An enzyme like telomerase is a protein. It will be broken down. Essentially what you are doing is you have expensive urine. Don't take those. You will very rarely hear me say don't take or do take, but yeah, don't take, don't, yeah, all right. Was there another question up here? No, okay, so let's talk about another marker of aging. All right, this one is called an epigenetic clock. And I'm really frustrated that I am not gonna be able to explain this in the way that I would like to explain it to you. And in part, it's because it's built on a lot of science that we don't have time to get into the nuances on. And in part, it's also because we don't really understand the biology behind why it seems to do what it seems to do. But it seems to be pretty accurate. Okay, so it's the, it right now is the most robust measurement we have. The most robust biomarker. And lots of people are now thinking this may be that marker that we use to track aging and to measure interventions of aging against. This involves something called DNA methylation. So for the teachers and the students that are hearing this, you guys know because you've memorized that DNA is a double helix structure and A is across, the A nucleotide and the T nucleotide form one set of rungs and the G's and the C's form another. We're gonna talk about the C's, the cytosines, one of the four letters of DNA. Some of these cytosines get a methyl group added to it. That's one carbon and three hydrogens that are put on it. So Here's your cytosine chemical structure for my chemistry fans in the room. Methylated cytosine, same structure, but it's got the carbon and three hydrogens on it. This happens only at the cytosines, not at the A's, not at the T's, and not at the G's. And it doesn't happen in every cytosine. It only seems to happen to a subset of them. And some of them seem to be in and around genes, and some of the cytosines don't have to be in and around genes, but they get methylated. And there are ways that we can measure which C's on my DNA actually get methylated over time. Now, why do we care if the C's get methylated, if they get the CH3 group put on it? Well, we know that when we methylate the outside of the DNA, when I put these CH3's on, I change the way the DNA is packaged. Methyl groups here, shown up here, actually, in some instances, more tightly pack my DNA together. And if my DNA is really tightly coiled on top of each other, I can't access the genes in that region, so I can't turn those genes on to make the protein that I need. So methyl groups, in many instances, silence genes. Now, that's, that's not always the case. There are other instances where it doesn't silence genes. It actually seems to activate genes, but the important point is when you add methyl groups to the DNA, you change the activity of genes. Some genes are turned on, some genes are turned off. As we age, many of our genes appear to be methylated and appear to lose their ability to be functional. When we are embryonic cells, we have much less methylation because all of our genes are active because as our cell types are figuring out what they need to be, I'm gonna be lung, I'm gonna be muscle, I'm gonna be brain, they need to be able to access any of their genes in order to make the products each of those types need. And then as we begin to age, the methylation levels in many places, not all places, but many places tend to increase. So if I can measure that level of methylation over time, is that a good marker of aging? In other words, how many of these methyl groups get stuck on your DNA at specific places? Can I use that as my biomarker? And that's the whole concept of the 
epigenetic clock. Now this piece right here, we are not clear exactly what aspects of aging are driving the clock. We don't get the biology behind it. But clearly there is something going on that is replicable in multiple different types of tissue, in multiple different populations of different ethnic groups that we can reproducibly say, okay, how many of these sites are methylated across your cells? And we can use that to calculate your clock age, the, the methylated clock age of that cell type. So here's a whole bunch of information about the clock. Um, there's a high correlation with chronological age, the amount of methylate, the patterns of methylation over your lifespan tie very closely. We can use these clocks and just look at your methylation and some of them can guess your chronological age within three years. I don't know anything else about you. I look at your methylation patterns and estimate your clock. I can guess your clock age. If you go all the way back to our session where we talked about forensics, and I can build a profile of a suspect based on their DNA, potentially you could guess the age of this suspect by looking at their molecular clock. Um, developed with large samples from multiple ethnic groups, that's important for reproducibility. There are two different calculations, the Hovath and the Hanum clock. We're not gonna get into that, I just want you to know there are multiple clocks out there. This is kind of like VHS and beta. We have yet to see which one is ultimately gonna rise to the top. Um, the clock age is different among tissues. You, uh, certain tissues seem to age at a faster rate than other tissues, but it seems to be consistent from person to person at what the general age is. And we can identify, just like with the telomeres, that um, older clock readings, uh, different, that, that um, levels of methylation consistent with older biological age are associated with aging disorders and with people that have age-related types of disorders. And there is a company. <laughs> we have a lot of enterprising individuals around the, around the world, around the country and around the world. There is a company that actually will look at your cheek samples, or I suppose you could send them other samples as well, I don't know, and they will look at the methylation patterns, look at these CH3s, and they'll tell you what your, epi epi your, whew, your epigenetic clock age is. Now, this is of limited value. <laughs> Since we don't understand the biology behind it, this, the first papers about these methyl clocks came out in 2013. So this is new data. Some of you were sitting in here in a Biotech 201 when this kind of stuff came out. I mean, this has not been around for long periods of time. Um, this is what we do know. And again, this is incredibly simplistic. This is an, a gross oversimplification, and I apologize for that. Studies have shown that healthy foods, in other words, not um, takeout from McDonald's, from fast food places, sorry, I shouldn't call out McDonald's, not a fast food diet. A diet that's high in vegetables, that's high in healthy fats, that's high in um, poultry as opposed to red meat, actually seems to slow or even turn back your molecular clock. Exercise, being physically fit, turns back your molecular clock. Now it turns it back, we don't know if it turns it back in the long term or if it just turns it back in a short term. We don't know if there are long term implications. Again, this is relatively new data. We know that stress, uh, things like PTSD, childhood violence, actually accelerate your clock. We know that men's clocks are further ahead. There's more aging than women's clocks, just like with the telomere data. We know that in cancer, there is a fat, an accelerated clock. There's an accelerated clock in the brain cells that are affected of individuals with neurodegenerative disease. So these cells, whether it's an individual in Parkinson's, an individual with Alzheimer's, there's brain cells that are 
damaged in these neurological disorders show evidence of aging more rapidly. Now, whether that's, whether the methylation is a cause or simply an indicator of aging, again, we don't fully understand the biology. We know that um, high BMI, individuals with high BMI have an aged molecular clock. Some of this may be related to the inflammation that's associated with extra weight. Again, right now we have somebody come up to me at the break and said, from a statistics viewpoint, I need to remind everyone that correlation does not equal causation, and that is absolutely right. We have lots of correlations right now, and we have very few causations. So molecular clocks, Keep an eye on this. We will be hearing, I believe, more about molecular clocks as an indicator of our age. Or there'll be some other bioindicator that will come along that will be even better that we'll work with. The important thing is we need to find something that predicts how we are aging, how parts of our body are aging, because we have to have some way, other than just saying how old are you, to identify what parts of your body are aging more slowly and what parts are aging more rapidly so we can begin to think about what interventions might work. So what do we know right now? You could, you know this before I even put it up on the screen. This is the stuff that we know positively influences your health. Exercise, the right kind of diet, adequate amounts of sleep, Mindfulness and how we respond to stress, low BMI, watching our weight. Those are the things that we know. This is what our physicians have been telling us. You do not have to have a genetic test to know this information. I think the genetic tests will give us some additional insight, especially if we can figure out what types of genetic changes in us may predispose us to certain um, how our body breaks down foods, how our body utilizes nutrients and stores fat, how our body ages, how we can turn back or counteract or slow some of that aging. But right now, this stuff, which is the same stuff that we talk to kindergartners about, this is what we ought to all be paying attention to, how we do those sorts of things. That right now is how we can say, this is what we do to keep us healthy and to keep us young. You don't have to have a genetic test for that. I think biotech will help us, but again, this, this is the stuff that, this is the best predictors that we have right now. All right, so that was our super fast run through how can biotech, can biotech help me lose weight and identify the ideal exercise plan, and what can it tell me about my death and my age? It's fascinating stuff. And as you saw from the weight study, it changes all the time. So what conventional wisdom or what scientific wisdom is today is often changed by the paper that comes out tomorrow. Next week, we will wrap up our entire series. We're going to spend the entire time talking about one topic, which in a city like Huntsville, I think is quite relevant which is what can biotech do, what can genetics and genomics do to help us as we think about long-term space travel? Whether that's Mars or a return to the moon or some other form of deep space travel, how does genetics and biotechnology help us think about ways that we study the effects of long-term space flight, that we keep our crew safe, that we think about agriculture and food sources in space and on other planets? So we're going to dig into lots of these different aspects and look at, in some cases, what is NASA telling us that they're doing? What are other groups doing that have a connection into that sort of stuff? So we'll spend the entire week on that. Um, I think it's going to be really, uh, I think you're really going to enjoy it. We're, we're going to have a fun, a fun time with that as well. So thank you for being with me tonight. I hope you have a safe trip home, and I will see you back next week. Have a good night, everybody.